glad to be able to hear with you all. Thank you for being able to make it here today as we continue to worship God at this time by now listening to his word. Um, as we still hear, uh, Michael read to us a passage in Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Uh, if you were here uh, last Sunday, we wrapped up, finished the book of Mark. Um, it was a, not a short journey, but we were able to go through the entirety of the book. Uh, and that is my heart for us, for us to not just have just bits and pieces uh, throughout the book, in certain books in the Bible, but for us to see the whole picture, uh, that's how we should be reading uh, these individual books in the Bible, not just bits and pieces, but the entirety of it, because it helps us to not only get the context of it, but to really see the whole picture within the details as well. And here, as we wrap up Mark, we're now in the book of Ruth. Um, it is my desire for us as the EM, as a church, to get into all the books of the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. And so we actually started back and forth in Old Testament, New Testament, and that's what we're doing here today. We just wrapped up the book in the New Testament, and now we're going to go into the Old Testament. Ruth is actually a very, rather short book in the Old Testament. So with that in mind, we're actually after Ruth, we're going to go into the book of Esther afterwards. So we're going to cover actually two uh, short books in the Old Testament. I pray that you are edified, you're challenged, you're encouraged, that you learn as well and grow God's word. That is my prayer for us. So just a little bit of context for us to get started. Um, it's helpful to know just certain context of the book for us to get like a starting picture of what we're going into. The book of Ruth is named for its main character, Ruth. We saw her name mentioned in the opening passage here. Um, Jewish tradition credits Samuel as the author, but there's neither internal nor external sources that say that that's actually who the author is. We actually don't know. This story most likely first appeared during David's reign, that's King David, in Israel, and the book is only four tra chapters, as I just mentioned. Um, if you look at it, it's only 85 verses. But the time it covers in these 85 verses, these four chapters, timeline-wise is around 11 to 12 years. The genre, the literary genre of the Book of Ruth is of a uh, historical narrative. It is a story. Some themes that we'll see in Ruth, amongst others, are kindness, grace, redemption, sovereignty of God, trusting in God. And the major overarching purpose from my reading of it is to praise God's sovereignty, his protection over his people, and his desire for his people to flourish. And of course, like all the books in the Bible, whether implicitly, or we may not even see it within the reading, points to Christ. I pray that we keep these in mind as we move forward through this journey through the book of Ruth. Now, as we go into uh, today's passage, when one reads, I don't know, any type of story, right? When one reads a story, there's usually a flow of things happening, right? Uh, usually, the issue or the tension of a story comes about sometime later, right? Uh, but in the opening passage of Ruth, we see that there is this tension, there is this issue, and we see that not all is well. Now, the book of Ruth starts with a description of the times in which these events took place in the days when the judges ruled. These were days of violence, lawlessness, civil wars, but most of all, spiritual darkness in the land. And on top of that, there was a famine as well. And as we saw in the opening passage, things get even worse as we read of not one, but three separate deaths. And so within the first opening verses, we are left with a grieving widow with her two widowed daughters-in-law. 
in a foreign land. So as mentioned earlier, the book of Ruth takes place, as we see here in the very opening verse of this book, in the days when the judges rule. As you see, if you, if you have your Bible, if you just turn the page right before, you see that it's the book of Judges. This was one of the darkest periods in Israel's history. The period of the Judges came after, timeline-wise, after the promised land was settled. Think of uh, Joshua's death. Okay? And before the monarchy was established. Think of King Saul. So it was in that time frame that the period of Judges came. Now, during this time, the period of Judges, there was no national government. And Israel was pretty much just a collection of tribes. The book of Judges shows the downward spiral of Israel as a nation and its spiritual life and shows its need for a godly king to lead them. We're not going too much into it just to give us an overview of the book of Judges. If you read it, you see it's a repeated cycle of events. God's people rebel against him, turn their backs on God. They chase after idols, false worship, whatnot. And then God gives them into the hands of their oppressors as judgment. God's people then repent. At least during the first few cycles, if you read through the book of Judges. And then when they repent, God sends a deliverer, a.k.a. a judge, to give the people a period of rest. And if you read the final five chapters of Judges, it shows in detail a nation that has just completely lost its way, becoming just like its surrounding nations that they were living in. And the final verse in Judges kind of shows what it was all about. It was a period as Judges chapter 21 verse 25 ends with everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now with that in mind, we move on. So this is a time and period that this, uh, the context timeline-wise that the Book of Ruth is in. In addition, we read that there was a famine in the land. Probably none of us here have experienced through a famine before. The people here during this time, people were hungry, they were struggling. And interestingly here, as we read here, it's highlighted, the famine even reached Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread. There's some irony there. Israel was supposed to be the land flowing with milk and honey but you cannot find bread in the house of bread. Now we have to read the situation, I believe, with Deuteronomy in mind. From what I read in Deuteronomy, in chapter 28, God had promised blessing on his people for obedience, which included things like defeating their enemies, abundant crops, but then in the same chapter, 28 in Deuteronomy, God also warned of curses for disobedience, which included infertility, defeat from their enemies, and famine. So with that in mind, it was seen that because of Israel's disobedience during the time of Ruth, God's warning came true. Unfaithfulness to God resulted in a famine in the land as the fields were barren and the crops failed. People were desperate because they were under the judgment of God. Now this famine should have led the people to repent. And if they did, as Deuteronomy chapter 30 says, that God would promise them to lift this curse 
But then we read in the passage a one family led by a man named Elimelech. Now, in those days of the judges and famine, Elimelech decided to move his family out of Israel into the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. Now, earlier we heard how Bethlehem means house of bread. Elimelech's name also means something. Elimelech's name means my God is king. Ironic that the place where they leave has no food and his own name means my God is king. But instead of repenting, he takes matters into his own hands and does not act if his God is king. Instead of turning back to the Lord, this family actually turns their backs on the Lord. Instead of mourning over the sin of the land that they're seeing, and asking God to restore things, and trusting in God, Elimelech leaves the land of Israel to a foreign land where food was more abundant. Now, when we read Elimelech doing that, we can certainly um, sympathize with him. He was probably just wanting to provide as uh, for his family. But one thing we have to keep in mind is that this was a very unique situation for Elimelech and his family. His choice here were not equal choices, theologically speaking, in the way that the choice of city in which to live and work might be for us today. We can perhaps serve the Lord equally well in New York, Los Angeles, Dallas, Mexico City, Seoul, Korea, or even right here in Raleigh, North Carolina. However, for Elimelech and his family, in his unique situation, God had delivered his people from Egypt and brought them, carried them to the promised land as a, as a special place for them to live in. Elimelech's move was not like that of a person today moving to another state or another country out of desperation seeking opportunity. God had promised that his presence would be with them in the promised land. God had promised to bless his people should they walk in obedience and to repent in disobedience. But from verse 1, it would seem that Elimelech's family journey to Moab was a temporary visit. It may have started off that way. As they read here, went to sojourn, meaning a temporary stay in the country of Moab. Maybe maybe things after got settled a little bit, they would go back. But then we read in verse 2, the end of verse 2, that they made a certain decision. We read that they remained there. Or they made this place their permanent place to live. So when we read that, this land of Moab must have been a great place to live, right? Got food, got this, all that. But for Israel, Moab was known for several things. I mentioned them here. None of them good. The Moabites had originated out of an incestuous relationship between Lot and his older daughter. Their king, the Moabite king, had hired a prophet to curse Israel when Israel came out of Egypt. The Moabites had been a stumbling block to Israel in the wilderness, seducing them to participate in false worship and sexual immorality. And they had recently, in the time of one of the earlier judges, they had oppressed the Israelites. Doesn't sound like a place to go to raise a 
and godly and God honoring family. It seems that to Elimelech, God was no longer king in his heart, just like many of his fellow Israelites. And like the people of the day, he acted by doing what was right in his own eyes as he saw himself as king. The appropriate response to the famine would have been to remain in Israel, repentance and faith, to call others to repentance and faith, and to ultimately trust in the Lord. But it seems that he believed in his, again, his own eyes, that the best way was to go to the land of compromise than to stay in the land of promise. And he didn't go alone. As he took his wife, Naomi, whose name means pleasant or sweet, and his two sons, Malon and Chilion. The name Malon most likely comes from a word meaning sick, and the name Chilion means frailty and mortality. It will look like through his wife and two sons' names, that was nothing really pleasant. And the passage is preparing us for what is about to happen. Now, it would seem that the best decision was made by Elimelech in going to Moab. It would seem so. But things actually get worse, especially to his wife, Naomi. As we see in the passage that we just said, she experiences a nightmare, a death in her family as her husband, Elimelech, dies. We are not told why. Or how? But then a bitter irony is seen as a man named again, my God is king, God. And after her husband is dead, she is then left with her two sons. So Naomi and her two sons, after Elimelech's death, I want to say that they had a decision to make at that point. Perhaps they could have repented and gone back home to their land and to their God or they could stay where they were. But as we see, they decide to stay in Moab. As a result of staying, we read that Naomi's sons take Moabite women as their wives. Now, context here is to help us out. Uh, the law given to the Israelites did not prohibit marriage to Moabites as the Moabites were not listed with the nations that God mentions in Deuteronomy chapter 7. But the Moabites worship a foreign god called Kemosh, which then would have gone against God's decree of not associating with the nations that worship a false god, because in turn, it would turn the people of Israel to turn to these foreign gods through these marriages. So with that, the Moabites would have also been a nation that the Israelites were not to associate with and intermarry. But from Naomi's point of view, the situation that she was in, she probably welcomed these two marriages as medicine for her grief of losing her husband. So even after her husband Elimelech died, Naomi was still reasonably well-situated in life. She had her sons, they were young, they were married, they had, and she had prospect of having future descendants to take care of her in old age. For 10 years, as we see in the passage, everything seemed to be going pretty well. But then as we see in the passage, it doesn't stop there for Naomi. As both her sons, Malone and Chilion, die, she's now left with her two daughters. 
against all expectations, there is no report of children born to the couples during the 10 years that they're there. And Manon and Shelian die without leaving children. And just like with Elimelech, we are not told how and why these two sons die. Perhaps there are some questions that came up, maybe in Naomi's mind, perhaps. Was this punishment for marrying the Moabites? Or was this a judgment for us not returning to Israel? We don't know. But whatever the case, we see the fact of the matter is Elimelech's family now lacks the next generation. Ironically, the family goes to Moab to get food for survival and when Israel was barren. But now there is barrenness in the family as there are no children to continue on the family line. And in Israel, they're called in the culture, there was no greater tragedy than a family to cease to exist. In the space of half a verse, Naomi's whole life comes crashing down around her. She is a widow in a foreign land. She has no significance in that time. She has no husband to protect and provide. She has no sons. So in that time and context, she has no social standing and no hope of carrying on her family line. She is aging, and she cannot support herself by working because in those days, again, in that culture and time, women simply did not work. She was a stranger in a strange land, aging, single woman of no significance in a family-oriented culture with no one to care for or care about her. What now? For us today, as we know, we make many decisions in life. Uh, we make decisions that even though we're not making decisions. It can be very light, very just everyday situational decisions. What clothes am I going to wear today for work or school or whatnot? What am I going to eat for breakfast? Feeling bacon, no, I'm feeling sausage. Oh, maybe I'll choose both today. Or maybe you want some ice cream afterwards and want to pick a flavor from a plethora of choices that we have. So we make choices like that every single day. But then there are times when we make certain defining moment decisions in our lives. Quote unquote, those big important decisions that has long term impact in our lives. On one hand, there are times when we consciously choose on the other hand, there are also times when it seems like the choice is made for us. But whether we make the choices or the choice is made for us, we're on a journey through life, a road that is heading towards a destination. But the question is, which road will each of us choose to walk on? If we're honest with ourselves, and I'm part of it as well. Very often in those defining important moments in our lives when we have to make a certain decision, the factors that weigh the most in our decisions are those that seem most likely to provide us with security and comfort. The bottom line in our lives oftentimes is rarely God's will as it is revealed in Scripture especially if God's will, according to Scripture, seem to go against our future, future prospects of happiness and success. For example, perhaps maybe many of us rarely think seriously about the impact our choices will have on our spiritual growth as an individual or perhaps as a family. Like, like Elimelech, 
We often don't look to God and his word and without seriously contemplating about the long-term impact, but simply make the choices that seems best in our own eyes. There are many who say that they are Christians and yet their Christianity has no real impact on their choices. Instead of looking into the word of God and making the decisions based on scripture as best as possible, the choices are usually made based on whatever makes the most practical sense, whatever is most convenient. At first, as seen for Elimelech, that he had made the most sensible and practical choice. All his people were suffering and hungry. There was food for them in Moab. So they decided to go. As we saw in the passage, the road to Moab turned out to be a road to nowhere. Often in our lives, the reality is not so immediate. Now, having said that, sometimes what makes practical sense actually can be good. I'm not saying that practicality just gets tossed out the window. But I do want to say that we cannot automatically believe that what is practical or convenient or seems to make the most sense is actually biblical or God-honoring. We may need to make choices, perhaps those important decisions that is perhaps unpopular, that is perhaps challenging, not what is practical, convenient, or easy. We should, we should see Elimelech's decision as a warning to us today. He took his wife and his sons, and they set out on a road, I believe, of disobedience as he saw best in his own eyes, and they had faced the consequences of his actions. If it just ended there, then we're just like, okay, then what do we do now? Is there any hope? But we worship a God of hope. And yet God, in his grace, had not left the family completely without survivors giving hope that there might be a future after all. As I read scripture, one thing is that very reliable is God's judgment on sin. But even more consistent is God's desire and his mercy and grace to restore wandering sinners back home to himself. This is both a challenging and comforting truth to us, I believe. Of course, like in the Old Testament times, we don't see perhaps physically and tangibly God's blessings in our obedience and cursings in our disobedience, like we see in the Old Testament. We don't go into exile, right? We don't get shipped up somewhere in some land because of our disobedience or experience abundant crops being grown in our obedience when we are faithful. Israel uniquely experienced these physical blessings and cursings. I believe as a foreshadowing of the final blessing and cursing to come on that last day. But at the end of the day, unfaithfulness and disobedience to God continues to be a road that leads to destruction and death. But here too, there is hope. Even for those who have chosen the way of rebellion and, per and persisted for a long time in the way of rebellion, there's still a way home. In God's grace, the road that seems to go nowhere may turn out to be a start towards God. Elimelech and perhaps Naomi too thought that the grass perhaps seemed greener on the other side. In this case, on the Moabite side. 
The food that the unpromised land offered seems so very real and so easily available and so tangible compared to the promised land and to the promises of God that they perhaps were not seeing. Like Amalek and perhaps Naomi as well, we also struggle in this area, don't we not? We often show a lack of trust in God's goodness and promises. Perhaps we may say it to one another, oh yeah, God's goodness, oh yeah, God's promises. But maybe in moments, we actually don't believe that. Perhaps we complain about perhaps the God, uh, the job God has given us, or even the spouse that we married, or the family or lack of family that God has placed in our lives. And what do we do when those things happen? Trust God, believe in his promises, or do we daydream, or we fantasize about uh, greener grass on the other side, greener fields elsewhere. Perhaps we have to confess that we too have also turned our backs on God many times and set off the fields of Moab in our lives. Or maybe we go back and forth depending on which side seems to be good and beneficial to us during these different times. Seems good over here, so we stay there. Oh, it doesn't look so good. Oh, the other side looks good, so we'll go over there. Back and forth. That is true of us today. We need to repent. We need to repent, turn away from that rebellion, that simple thought, Turn back to God and find forgiveness, find hope, find the transforming work that God does in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts. God's transforming work can be painful. And perhaps maybe sometimes we don't want that because we know that it's painful. And it can seem harsh, but while it may be painful, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. It is never harsh. Through it, God shows us the emptiness of the roads that we have chosen for ourselves so that we may return to his ways, not follow our own way. And when we return, we see that it's God's delight to fill the void that we have created, restores the brokenness that we have made, and he feeds our hungry souls that we are struggling with. Because when we humble ourselves and we recognize our inner poverty, God's grace lifts us up. We don't always understand what God may be doing in our lives in detail, but God is at work in the details of our lives as he is sovereign over us. So church, let us not simply make choices in our lives that seems to make the most sense in our eyes or in the eyes of others as well. Instead of being influenced by the world's way of thinking, the world's way of making decisions. Let us look to God's word and make those decisions that is biblical and God-honoring, even if it's challenging, even if it's unpopular. Church, let us believe in God's goodness and his promises. Not just simply with our lips, and voices, but with our hearts. Even if what stands right in front of us, in our faces, seems to shout at us otherwise. And church, let us not turn away or do the back and forth thing, but firmly decide 
turn towards God and follow the path that he has given for us to walk on. With faith, let us trust in God's sovereign grace over our lives. May we walk by faith as we look to Scripture to guide us. At this time, we'll take some time to pray in response to what we have just heard from God's Word. For just joining us for the first time, there's simply a time where we're going before the Lord in prayer. If there's anything that the Lord perhaps gave a thought to your mind or in your heart, I want to encourage you to not let that slip away or ignore it, but to go before the God with it. It may be a prayer or a thought, confession, it could be perhaps a request, see how you can understand what you just heard or see how you can apply it in your lives. Or perhaps you just don't know what to say before the Lord at this time. You can go before the Lord with that. But whatever it may be, I can encourage you to go before the Lord honestly and openly with your heart. But let's take some time to pray. Father God, Lord, we come before you humbled and thankful that you speak to us through your word here, the book of Ruth and these few verses. Father God, as you have um, perhaps spoken to us generally as a whole congregation here, but also individually in our lives, I pray, Lord Father, that we heed your word, we heed your moving in our hearts and our minds, that we would prayerfully and obediently take action, respond. Lord, as we read in today's word, I pray for us today, in the 21st century in our lives, I pray that we will not simply make choices in our lives that seems to make the most sense, or makes the most sense in the eyes of others, or what the world says makes the most sense, but Lord, even if it's challenging, even if it's difficult, unpopular, perhaps even painful, pray that you will move us to make those decisions that it's biblical, worshiping to you, glorifying you, and honoring your God. May that be our heart. And Lord, when we make certain decisions, Certain things will pop up in our faces in our lives where it seems like, God, you're not good, and that your promises are falling apart. I pray that we not only say it, but really and truly believe that, God, you are good, and your promises are sure. Let us not turn away from you, do the back and forth thing, but firmly decide to turn towards you and follow the path that you have given to each one of us. And visually, as a family, I pray that you help us in our minds and our hearts and our souls to trust in your grace, your sovereign grace over our lives. That we walk by faith, not by sight. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name we pray all these things. Amen.